if living things can do it, prokaryotes are probably doing it. Here are two exceptions, endosymbiosis and multicellularity. List steps in the process of endosymbiosis. Give examples and exa evidences for the theory. List similarities between prokaryotes and semi-autonomous organelles. List steps in the early evolution of eukaryotes. Be able to define and compare colony and multicellularity. Be able to list steps and things necessary for the evolution of true multicellularity. Do note, eukaryotes here are the things that have a true nucleus. This is a group that is not as diverse as other domains. There are not as many niches filled. Eukaryotes don't have halophiles or thermophiles. There are both unicellular and multicellular eukaryotes. There are large ones and small ones. In class, we're going to have an in-group activity, but you're not in class. So what is special about having these membrane-bound organelles? Well, first off, it allows them to have complex cytoskeletons with complex cytoskeletal proteins. Membrane-bound organelles allow the separation of different functions in space within a cell. So different things can be done in different compartments. For example, the DNA and the transcription can be done in a different compartment than the energy-rich and high in oxygen metabolism. And we're going to look at two specific membrane-bound organelles today because you've looked at the other organelles in Bio-141, and those are chloroplasts and mitochondria. Where did chloroplasts and mitochondria come from? This is something called endosymbiotic theory. Back in the day, there was a eukaryote, and that eukaryote could make membrane-bound organelles like its nucleus and its endoplasmic reticulum. At some point, it phagocytized a oxygen using non-photosynthetic prokaryote, much like the ones we looked at in a previous lecture. And these were ones with highly invaginated membranes, and they became a mitochondrion. It's better to keep this around instead of just digesting it. And these eukaryotes did much better because they could use oxygen much more efficiently and could do more metabolism than the other eukaryotes. So they overwhelmed the previous existing eukaryotes, and most eukaryotes now have mitochondria. At least once, what happened was a chloroplast, which is something like a cyanobacteria, was taken in by one of these eukaryotes and likewise not digested, and this became the chloroplast we know today. Some evidence for this theory. First off, mitochondria and chloroplasts reproduce on their own. They don't overwhelm the cell. They actually reproduce in symbiosis with the cell. Uh, for example, when you work out your muscles by running a lot, you actually produce more mitochondria. They will divide without your cells actually dividing. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own DNA, and there are two membranes surrounding the mitochondria and the chloroplast. This isn't very clearly shown in this picture, but you can see it in the electron microscope if you have very good eyes. The mitochondria is used for respiration. This is where carbon compounds are oxidized. There's a highly convoluted inner membrane. You can actually see there that little thing of DNA. That is a highly reduced nucleoid. There are ribosomes within the mitochondria that are not the same as the ribosomes within the cell. We know that the inner membrane is the site of the electron transport chain with very specific proteins there. The matrix is the site of the Krebs cycle. This is where most eukaryotic respiration gets done now is in the mitochondria. The chloroplasts are where photosynthesis takes place. This is where carbon is reduced using energy from light. There are the thylakoid membranes. This is the inner convolutions of the membrane are now thylakoids. The thylakoid membrane is the site of the electron transport chain. Again, you see DNA in there. And you can see that the stroma is the site of the Calvin cycle. If it was good enough to do once, why not do it twice? Well, red algae could also be taken up in something called secondary endosymbiosis. So some of these cells, instead of taking up a cyanobacteria, took up a green algae or a red algae. And when they did this, there would be three membranes around there, or four membranes too, depending. This is secondary endosymbiosis, and this may have happened multiple times, giving rise to stromatopiles, alveolates, euglenids, and chloroacneophytes. It's hard to know when eukaryotes truly evolved because internal plasma membranes don't actually fossilize very well. If you're thinking about fossils, you're probably thinking about something like bones or plants, and if you're not thinking of a single membrane. So it's tough to say when it happened, but it probably happened around 1.8 billion years ago. So eukaryotes are relatively recent on the phylogeny of life.
what happened soon after is they became multicellular. And we're going to look at multicellular as distinct from other forms of life where a lot of cells grow together. That would be colonies. Colonies are when cells divide and then they don't really leave. If you're thinking about those um, stromatolites from earlier, that's basically a colony of bacteria. Here we have a colonial algae shown here where they have reproduced but not detached. Filamentous bacteria are pretty similar to co causing colonies, and we see colonies in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. What real multicellularity is, is going to be somewhat more differentiation. So we can see this on a family tree here. Chlamydomonas is a single-celled organism. Gonium is a colonial organism, just like Pandorina. But Pandorina actually has something else here. It's got an extracellular matrix. So we can see that there are cells within there that are going to be held by this extracellular matrix. It's secreted by the cells for the purpose of holding them together. There is also cellular differentiation. Not all cells are going to be putting their tails out and swimming around. Some cells are going to focus on secreting extracellular matrix. Some cells are going to focus on reproduction. That cellular differentiation is going to be necessary for a true multicellular organism. We can see this in animals where the coanoflagellates would form a colony sticking together and moving their flagella around in order to capture and digest food. We see sponges, on the other hand, have cellular differentiation and have an extracellular matrix with little spicules holding the cells together. And other animals would arise from the multicellular sponges and would have further differentiation and more complicated extracellular matrices. So what's needed to be multicellular? First off, the extracellular matrix. Next, proteins to connect cells to one another and to connect cells to the matrix. And last, differentiation between cells. One good example of multicellularity as a model system is dictyostelium. This little creature is an aggregation of cells, but they only aggregate when nutrients are low. And when they aggregate, they form this little slug that moves along and hopefully moves towards an area of higher nutrients. If they don't, then they'll actually stop and form a fruiting body to make spores to allow the spores to go to farther away locations. The fruiting body requires a stalk. And that stalk is going to be made of organisms that will not have offspring. So they actually have to sacrifice themselves for others to actually go out and make spores. This self-sacrifice only happens when they are related genetically to the organisms that are going to go forth and make spores. Thus, relatedness is needed for multicellularity.